can hear me. Hello, good morning, London. Uh, good to see you all. This is a very, I have to say, very tough act to follow. I've never been, uh, you know, climbing on stage right after such a stimulating and juicy discussion about a topic that concerns each and every one of us. So hopefully we will uh, live up to the uh, vibe and atmosphere and be equally entertaining. Uh, I have to, you know, apologize in advance that the people that I'm going to invite off on stage have pretty boring titles such as CEO and creative director. None of them has uh, the title of chief pleasure officer. Uh, but nonetheless, I hope that uh, the discussion will be stimulating and inviting. So without further ado, let me invite our distinguished panelists to the stage. Please. Okay, so today uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce our panelists in a second. I'll just say that today we're going to talk about brands and online advertising. And, um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm definitely confused. Nice. I feel like um, reading the media and participating in such industry events and just talking to people, every day there's a new uh, standard technology platform, uh, some sort of innovation like uh, virtual reality or live video. And ultimately, we get vibes from everyone around us that we should stop everything we're doing and focus only on that because this is the future. And if we're not going to catch up with the future right now, we're going to be left behind and our brands are going to die. And the goal of today's session will be to sort through some of those emerging trends, some of those new technologies, some of this innovation, and try to form a mutual point of view about uh, is it uh, hype or the real thing? Is it sustainable? Is it really bound for growth? Or is it just some sort of a temporary novelty that, uh, that will go away uh, before long. And in order to answer those questions, we have gathered some of the brightest minds in the industry today. Uh, let's start with a quick introduction. We have uh, Rachel Waller, who is the Director of Online Communications at Farfetch. Hello, good morning, Hi. Rachel. Maybe you can tell us, for those of us who have lived in a cave and haven't heard yet about Farfetch, maybe you can say a few words about what you guys do. Sure, so for those of you who don't know, Farfetch is an online marketplace. We work with luxury independent boutiques, and increasingly we're starting to work directly with brands. <clears throat> Great. And uh, uh, to your right is uh, Nathan Coyle, who is the CEO of Domino, who came all the way from New York City. So you know, for you, it's uh, <laughs> about 4 a.m. in the morning right now. Uh, just in case he falls asleep during the session, don't take it personally. Exactly. Nathan, tell us a little bit about Domino. Sure, yeah, Domino is an American company, so um, not a huge footprint in the UK, so if you haven't heard of it, um, it's not that you're out of it, it's just that we haven't uh, arrived on these shores yet. But we're a multi-platform company, content, commerce, publishing, magazines, books, digital media, commerce, native retail, all rooted in home design, decor, home furnishings, but really through the, the filter of lifestyle. So we're about beautiful homes, but also the interesting people who live there and, and what's her story. Um, and, uh, and again, told across you know, a variety of different media and channels and selling all of the things that we talk about. Thank you, Nathan. And all the way from the Czech Republic comes uh, Jamie Mendelbaum, who is the chief creative officer of uh, Young and Rubicon in Europe. Uh, so YNR, we're a global ad agency. Uh, I oversee Europe, as, as the title says. We, uh, we help companies generate uh, value for consumers and for their brands. So. Perfect, thank you. And last but not least, we have uh, Tony Gerardelli. Gerardelli. I'm, my, I'm <laughs> practicing by Italian, uh, who is the uh, head of innovation promotion at uh, Intensa Sao Paulo. So tell us a little about those of us who don't invest in the Italian market. What does uh, Intensa Sao Paulo do? Yeah, we are, we are the biggest Italian bank one of the biggest in Europe. Uh, as Innovation Center, our mission is uh, spreading out uh, the innovation culture towards the employees, towards internal employees. We are more than 90,000 uh, employees uh, and towards our, our customer, more than uh, uh, 11 million of customers. So it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, it's a sounds, that sounds like a growing startup. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So uh, let's get started. We're going to play a little game called Swiper. Maybe uh, the tech guys can help me put the uh, laptop stage on the screen. There it is. Uh, and in this game, I'm going to confront the panelists uh, by uh, suggesting a topic about one of the emerging trends in our in industry. And uh, they will try to uh, help me decide whether we are swiping right for approval, meaning you know, we think that this is a meaningful thing. This is part of the future of brand and online advertising. 
and digital storytelling, or is it a fad? Is it something that's just going to vanish and go away? So uh, we'll you know, demonstrate it as we start uh, with the very first thing, which is chatbots. So the way I see it, we live in an era in which people consume most of their, co most of their content and most of their interaction with brands through a device that is primarily a communication device. So when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we do is we reach out to our cell phone and we see a bunch of notifications. Some of them are coming from our friends and some of them are coming from content applications or from brands. So we have a variety of messages, some of them personal, some of them professional, and some of them are advertisement. What do you, know, do you guys think that chatbots is uh, a viable way of telling a story and of creating actual interaction with a brand? Rachel, you want to take this one? Sure. So I personally love the idea of chatbots. Um, I think it's kind of interesting in, in two scenarios. One, if it's done well, you can give your brand a bit of personality. You know, I think there's some clever things brands like Sephora have done that you can, you can be quite playful and you can give your brand a tone of voice. The other reason I think chatbots are super interesting, especially when I think about things like customer services, is that actually it allows the customer to interact in, within a platform that they want. So my mom is unlikely to ever tweet customer services, but she might interact with a chatbot via WhatsApp or iMessage. And I think actually that adds real value in terms of how you interact, because you're actually taking people back into the communication channels that they want. So I think it kind of opens up accessibility. So I, I think there's a big opportunity there. So you're interesting. You would swipe right. Tony, okay. how about you? Do you think <laughs> it's feasible that people will, uh, rather than go physically to the bank or interact with uh, uh, you know, AI-based app, actually have a uh, one-to-one -one dialogue with their bank through a chatbot? You know, will this uh, technology make its way to a very traditional industry? We are not so sure um, how huge will be the impact of a chatbot. Uh, but anyway, we have uh, a group that is studying uh, very deeply uh, because obviously uh, millennials doesn't want to go in a, in a, in a bank offices. So our uh, digital transformation is... Uh, I mean, it's uh, on the way uh, since many years, uh, but it's still becoming uh, more uh, uh, impactful than in the past. Uh, and so chatbots uh, will be one of the ways in which one we have to create some touch point uh, with uh, the new millennial generation customer. Interesting. So I guess that, uh, uh, the common perception is that we're swiping right on chatbots. <laughs> Ta-da! Uh, which uh, uh, brings us to artificial intelligence. And uh, you know, let's use your uh, actual, real, tangible intelligence, uh, start, starting with you, Nathan, to talk about uh, you know, whether AI or what kind of role would uh, AI play in uh, digital advertising and in uh, building powerful brands. Yeah, I mean, I think all advertisers recognize and embrace the role of data. And, and the more data that the advertiser has, and in the, my case, the publisher, to understand the audience and the consumer, the more powerful that we can be. And so as AI, you know, right before our very eyes is continuing to evolve, um, become more accessible, more effective, and, and generate tools that marketers can use, I think it's incredibly powerful. And I think we're just seeing the beginning of what it can do to, to make the way in which we engage consumers, whether we're the advertiser or the publisher, the most relevant to that audience. Interesting. How about uh, are your clients, Jamie, asking for any uh, AI-based solution, or is it still about you know good old human creative work? I think you know, like like everything, whether it's chatbots or whether it's artificial intelligence, they're tools. You know, uh, some people have with the same set of tools have in history have built I don't know the Sistine Chapel, and with the same set of tools they have built a shed. You know, so I think. It all depends how you use it, how you apply it. I think uh, if it is right within the customer journey, if it makes sense for what you're doing to building a brand, then yes, it's, it's interesting. But I think if it becomes uh, innovation for innovation's sake, uh, only like a race towards uh, innovation, I think sometimes people or consumers, they might, you know, sometimes they have simpler needs than what uh, an engineer might be looking at. I don't know if... Uh, Anyone uh, watches uh, Westworld on uh, on uh, Statistically, HBO? I assume there are quite uh, in the audience. You know, I, I find that quite interesting because you know, like, if, in case you don't see it, it's uh, in case you don't watch it, it's like uh, you have this team of engineers that have developed a park where you have artificial intelligence robots uh, that are 
so perfect that they're mistaken for uh, human beings. And, uh, you know, the incredible, it's an incredible feat of human engineering, yet what do people, most consumers that go to the park, what do they do? They shoot them and they fuck them. You know what I mean? It's like, it's the, Sounds great. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, someone has just developed a robot that can actually think up emotion and all the people that go there, that's what they do. You know, so I think sometimes if we get too much into the innovation itself, we might lose track of what people actually want to do. Interesting. So it sounds like we have, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say neutral, but uh, a more uh, uh, complicated view of the matter, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, being positive, uh, <laughs> let's write right on this one as well. Uh, you know, our audience is a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, not our audience, our panelists are, you know, very polite, they're still warming up, we're trying to get them to, um, you know, spill the juices a little bit and be a little bit more, uh, uh, more provocative. Hopefully the next topic will, uh, will raise some controversy. So, you know, we, which of you guys want to comment about virtual reality? Is virtual reality really going to be, you know, it's been out there for decades, the technology is there, everybody that tried it uh, always comments that it's very immersive, very interesting, but is it a novelty? Is it something that we're going to try every now and then at the corridor of a conference hall? Or will it become a part of our lives in the same manner that uh, video gaming and, and cell phones and other technologies have become. Anyone? Yeah, if you want to start um, you know, having more controversial points of view, I'm happy to, to, to kick that off. Right. What I can't understand is how there's such a conversation around virtual reality when the truth is that augmented reality is something that is, is just absolutely exploding in terms of consumer experiences. So, Virtual reality is amazing. I think there's an incredible future. I think there's a long road ahead in terms of adoption, and I think we've seen that with regards to the sales of different kinds of headsets being much slower than, than anticipated. Meanwhile, because of Snapchat, frankly, and other platforms, um, consumers, especially young consumers, are using augmented reality all the time, and there's just so many creative, fun, playful solutions that give real value and experiences mm -hmm. to consumers through augmented reality. Right. And, and to I name think one, you know, Pokemon Go was the most popular, Thank or you. is the exactly. most popular game of the year. Exactly. What about, as yes, it relates to brands specifically? Building a brand through a virtual reality experience, I'm sure there are a lot of dollars going their way just because it's, you know, in the news and people are experimental. Is it sustainable? Is it something that, you know, a more traditional industry, yeah. uh, representing the traditional industry today is Tony. You know, do you see yourself actually do banking in a virtual reality environment? D despite uh, most of you could think, uh, we are uh, <laughs> really interested in virtual reality for two different topics. Uh, th the first one is uh, we recently set up a new co called the Tessa San Paolo Casa, in which one we, we um, get into real estate business. Uh, and so the virtual reality uh, is uh, for our uh, agent on the territory is um, very important to uh, create an immersive experience uh, in uh, selling the house. So this is the first application that we are going to do. The second one is um, as the goal of uh, doing educational uh, against uh, the probability of the thief uh, uh, that wants to steal your money in the bank. So even if uh, everything is digitalizing, but someone is uh, still uh, thinking to, to get your money from the bank. And so we, uh, we, we do educational and training to our front office uh, colleagues in order to um, managing this unpleasable situation. Interesting. So, you know, apologies again for categor categorizing you as a representative of the uh, ah, I'm, old age. I'm proud to be the old after one. All, you are the head of innovation. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, we have a, a mixed opinion, but I will, you know, we'll go with Nathan that I guess uh, said, you know, virtual reality could be interesting, but for the moment it's, you know, less of an immediate priority, at least in terms of brand building. So, you know, we can uh, have our sw first swipe left of the day. Uh, live video. So live video is one of those things that uh, since all of us consume most of our content or discover most of our content through Facebook, uh, live video is unavoidable, right? It's one of the things that uh, Facebook has decided that it is uh, viewing as part of the future and inevitably it's already part of the present. Let's talk about, you know, whether it's one of those things that every now and then Facebook is trying to push and consumers are not adapting or, you know, do you think that uh, giving every individual, every publisher, and every brand the ability to form their own TV network on demand and serve it to consumers is something that will be key in, uh, in brand building going forward. I, 
I, I'm not sure about it. I think for me, as a marketer, the idea of my ad showing in live video makes me feel a little bit uneasy, because I think you have, obviously, with anything live, control is completely gone. So the risk of actually showing up in live video could be quite high. So I think that, that's kind of one issue for me. Then on the flip side, as a consumer, the thing that, that kind of bothers me as well is that you think probably most of the live video you consume, you consume on your phone, right? So you could be on 4G. So actually, then, as a consumer, I'm paying to stream ads, if you think about it from that perspective. So I think from a consumer perspective, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's what you're watching live for. And then from an advertiser perspective, live is just super risky. So mm -hmm. not a huge lover. Interesting. How many of you in the audience, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen live video. How many of you have broadcasted a live video session until today? So, you know, we have a few. For uh, young technology, it's definitely uh, showing some adoption. Um, all right, but I will, uh, you know, go with Rachel, who uh, seems to be suspicious of whether the uh, settings of live video are appropriate for such a carefully calculated and curated messaging as in uh, uh, brand promotion, and we'll swipe left. Um, In-house content solution. So we see, um, you know, it will be interesting specifically in Jamie's point of view or better, you know, better uh, about whether or not companies like YNR will go out of business because advertisers will start engaging publishers directly. We see the New York Times, we see the Wall Street Journal, and definitely the new digital natives like Vice and BuzzFeed form their own in-house creative agencies and uh, getting the media budgets themselves kind of taking the agency uh, out of the equation. Um, you know, how much of that do you see happening? And you know, how do agencies adapt to this uh, new uh, direct model? I think, I think it is something that you see some clients obviously uh, adopting that model, but I think soon enough, uh, a lot of them find on, on that journey that you know, if, if you're a single client with a single brand or whether you have a portfolio of brands, I think it's very hard once you, have, once you put creatives into the mix uh, these people want to have, you know, they want to switch and sometimes work on a different brand and, and have that, it's, it's that refreshing uh, sense of working on, on different brands and building different uh, uh, cases that I think attracts the best talent. I think there is a space for in-house content solutions. If you're talking like, let's say, hygienic things, whether it's like, you know, some, some things you might need. I don't know if, if you're, you know, need to churn out a ton of, uh, clothing photos or, or things like that, if you're in e-commerce, there's space for that. But will you be able to attract the best talent to do uh, uh, things for your brand if you have an in-house? Not so sure. Tony, how about you? I mean, would you consider uh, uh, spending your budget with one in-house agency, with one publication, and then potentially replicating it with each and every one? Or does it make sense for you to work with a centralized agency and then spread your creative work across multiple channels? Uh, we don't believe so much in having uh, an house agency, but we str strongly believe in uh, having native content uh, building by us. We created uh, um, a native video platform called Palco, that means uh, stage in Italian, in which one we post all videos uh, regarding non-economic, non-main business of the bank, of the principal business. So everything uh, is linked to uh, touch point and the experience with the customer, like music, uh, sports, uh, arts, culture. Uh, we post video and uh, we created uh, on uh, native uh, uh, storytelling and native uh, mood that we, we want to build. Uh, and uh, we strongly believe that this is the right way to, to go in the touch point with uh, some cluster of customer. Interesting. So we're saying the in-house agencies don't have to reside with the publisher. They can also reside with the brand itself. Nathan. Yeah, I would just say that this topic is a really interesting one in the world that we live in today, where native content, custom content, whatever you want to call it, is such an important part of the advertiser's toolbox. And to me, it's really not black or white. It's gray. I think any publisher... Well, gray doesn't, you know, we can't swipe upward or downward. They have to make a call. <laughs> good, so, uh, good point. But, uh, but any publisher, particularly digital and, or digitally native publisher, has to have this offering because it's, not, it's no longer about banners and boxes, right? It's about creating content with your editors, with your video team, 
for advertisers that's going to engage that consumer. It just comes down to is it packaged as part of your, your media offering or in the case, as you pointed out, of Vice, who um, you know, have really doubled down and said, wow, we can do this so well, we're going to have it as its own offering and, and have it structured and, and, and the financials actually work and the business proposition work like an agency. But there's a lot that's in between. And I okay. think that it's just a, a critically important piece for any, for any publisher uh, who wants to have and offer solutions for advertisers. Thank you. So it's not a clear cut. We have mixed opinions, but I guess, you know, if we have to vote, there was a two for one and, you know, we are swiping right on in-house content <laughs> solutions. Which brings us to, um, you know, a topic that you've kind of answered by virtue of addressing this question. So we already agreed, I guess. Everybody nodded and everybody uh, mentioned that uh, advertising has to go beyond the standard ad units into uh, uh, interactive native advertising and, uh, you know, as a self-serving statement from... Uh, from Playbuzz, the company which I work for, you know, this is what we do for a living, so I'm obviously a believer. Uh, tell us a little, maybe an example or, you know, just kind of a proof point of, you know, where did that serve you? Or, you know, where did you see that this really brings value and kind of superior engagement? Um, any of you, if you had that experience? Me? <laughs> um, I, I think in, in terms of, like for us, we're a multi-brand retailer, so, Actually, a lot of the native advertising we do is about showcasing multiple products that we have on Farfetch. So actually, there, there's a huge value for that being interactive because you don't want to click through a carousel and like get all the like links along the side of the carousel of products. Like that feels very dated. So I think there's a, from a multi-brand retailer, it being interactive is kind of a no-brainer. It, it should be. You should facilitate it. I, I think if we think more from the customer's perspective, we should allow them to interact wherever they want to be, however they, they want to interact. So for, for me, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. I'm, I'm with you. Great. I, I think any native ad experience has to have some interactivity. We, we recently did a, a program for a spray paint brand in the US called Krylon, and it was um, videos of how to hack furniture to make it your own, using spray paint to create patterns, et cetera. And we invited the audience to upload their own experiments, uh, you know, projects, et cetera, super successful. And it's that kind of leaned in, um, you know, consumer moment that any advertiser covets because then you know you've really broken through and have real engagement, which, you know, is ultimately the currency um, of, of creating an advertising program and, and something that's so hard to achieve. So let's talk about this currency for a second. Uh, you know, when we, uh, when we at Playbuzz sell native, uh, interactive native campaigns to, um, to clients, uh, we emphasize the high engagement. You know, how do you really translate, how do you quantify, how do you set this conversion rate, if you will, between the value of this currency uh, to an audience or to an industry that is used to measure things in you know, somewhat obsolete terms uh, or, or you know, KPIs in terms of how they uh, measure advertising efficiency? How do you do that when you're trying to uh, preach to clients that they should go beyond the uh, standard ad units into interactive ones? I mean, I think it always, again, does it add value to that brand? Uh, does it add value to the consumer? And I think if you're talking to an e-commerce, uh, obviously, you know, there are... It's very quantifiable. Yeah, exactly. It is very quantifiable. But depending on the brand you're talking to, uh, I don't know if you're selling or like for a bank, for example, depending on what it is, again, it, like, I think it is an easier sell because it is quantifiable as well like so that i think understanding the metrics is very easy now does it add value to the brand of the consumer or not and i think any client would understand the metrics once you explain it to them so i think explaining that is not an issue the question is whether it adds value or not right. totally may just at the point can you, can you take engagement to the bank <laughs> yeah no may just at the <laughs> point of, about uh, interactive native advertising we're doing and um, Important experience is going on uh, uh, sponsorizing X Factor edition of uh, it in Italy, and so it's a first experience for us in, um, in doing an, uh, a sponsorship and so important uh, uh, program uh, now with uh, with some mass market, uh, and uh, we are creating some native advertising interactive during the daily program. Uh, and uh, I mean, the metrics, uh, we are still on the progress, but the metrics uh, seems to be so interesting uh, for applying this kind of investment. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, you know, I think we have a general consensus of uh, swiping right. Uh, we mentioned the, the term, the name Facebook quite a lot, which is inevitable when you talk about one of the two companies that jointly control 
uh, more than 60% of the total global digital advertising uh, uh, market. Uh, one of the key initiatives that Facebook threw out last year and you know, caused a lot of commotion in the media, uh, not sure that I have the data, maybe you guys do, about you know, how much is it really adapted and, and you know, what is the consumer adoption to it, is Facebook Instant Articles, which is essentially uh, bringing the content, housing the content, publisher's content or advertiser content on Facebook and delivering it directly to consumer uh, based on their format and, and their own packaging. So, you know, that caused a riot uh, in the industry and brought up a lot of uh, potential antitrust discussions. Um, you know, how have you guys experienced instant articles and, you know, did that change in any way your, your dialogue with brands and, you know, kind of the way you do business online? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. I mean, it's, it's a really tough one and I think the, you know, the, the the jury's still out. Um, I mean, it's certainly a fantastic experience for the consumer because you get to the story much faster that you wanted to experience and you stay inside of Facebook. Um, you know, but for publishers, it's, you know, a bit of, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of, uh, you know, wolf in the hen house kind of a, a moment of, okay, fine, now we're going to relinquish even more control of our business, meaning the monetization uh, to Facebook and lose that click back to us. Um, but at the same time, we need that we need the users, we need the audience. So um, something we do, it's uh, a way that we make money, mm -hmm. um, but it's making money on Facebook's platform now 100% versus bringing that user to our owned and operated. And it's probably fair to assume that, uh, uh, you know, Facebook is the primary beneficiary of uh, this initiative. Correct. <laughs> Thank you um, Anybody else, since you know, Nathan wasn't decisive, I need one of you to you know, help me decide which direction to swipe. <laughs> Not yet. We, we are, we are studying, we are understanding how to, to convert our uh, followers uh, in a loyal customer. So we are um, probably a step beyond uh, Facebook Instant Perfect. Traffic. So it sounds like, at least for the moment, it's you know, not yet uh, something that you know, either of us fully banks on. So we'll swipe uh, left. Uh, another uh, uh, Facebook product is Instagram Stories. And specifically, as uh, Snapchat is ramping up for their IPO, and potentially holding the promise of uh, becoming the third leg or the third arm in uh, online advertising alongside Google and Facebook. We see Facebook going very aggressively after the same audience and very uh, openly, I would say shamelessly, uh, adopting a proprietary storytelling mechanism and advertising mechanism invented by Snapchat into their own tool set. Do you guys feel that this will be um, a primary tool for engagement with brands as well? I mean, I, I personally think it is, it is great. Obviously, it's probably quite, obvious, quite obviously a huge ripoff. Um, but I think from a brand storytelling perspective, it's, it's really valuable because we've kind of got to this point now where your Instagram feed is so curated, it it's actually becomes quite difficult to get content into those feeds. And not all content is now appropriate for your super curated feeds. So, you know, for when I think about some of the stuff that we do in our Instagram stories, you know, we have great events. You probably don't want to see a blurry event photo in your Instagram stream, but you probably do want to hear this great influence that we have talking about it and taking you through on an Instagram story. So actually, it becomes a very complimentary place for you to tell that story. And you kind of, whereas on Snapchat, it's actually really difficult to find, you know, to find your profile. You've already got this audience on Instagram, so it feels very complimentary. For, for us, I mean, if I may jump in, this is a, absolutely a swipe right. We love it. Our audience is a little bit older than the Snapchat audience. Our audience is, uh, you know, it's, we're selling home furnishings and, and talking to audiences about redesigning their home. So it's, you know, it's 25 to 44 even plus. So our audience doesn't exist on Snapchat. It's at, at, right. the, at the scale of, of, say, someone who targets 12 to 17. So now we have a tool that's just so powerful that we use to, to reach our audience. And with a new product that they launched last week, where now actually the user can take an action off of that story to come discover more about what we're talking about or what we're selling, it's fabulous. Great. Jamie, uh, when you guys talk to brands about uh, social media strategies, or you, know, you try to sell them on the premise of uh, letting you create experiences on social media for them. In a closed environment like Instagram, that until recently was completely closed to advertisers, and even now does it in a very restrictive way, what's really the KPI for the advertiser? Is it about 
the number of followers, the level of social engagement, or is it about uh, the volume of the exp exposure? What is it that they're looking for when they're paying good money to be on social networks? I think uh, they go with, you know, with the first kind of still, unfortunately, I think it is with the followers because it's not something that you can't yet, you know, see what is the quality of the followers you're getting? What is the quality necessarily of the, of the people you're getting? But I think you just have to trust the platform and the type of people that are in there uh, in the sense you kind of know who you're getting. But I think it's just a conversation that you need to have before with the client. So uh, the expectations are met going in. Uh, so they're not necessarily expecting just the number of followers to go because uh, to go up from one moment to the other because Instagram is a very different platform than Facebook. Perfect. How about the audience? You know, you guys obviously assume the majority of you have uh, semi-active Instagram accounts. How many of you have begun using this form of expression of Instagram stories on a frequent basis? How many of you are creating them? So, you know, somewhat of an, an early adoption where uh, we'd say, but you know, you guys indicate that you view it as a very viable tool for the industry and therefore will uh, enthusiastically uh, swipe right. Which brings us to this uh, you know, uh, uh, new thing called Snapchat. Obviously, the engagement is there. Is it really, look, you know, all of us probably, if either of us on stage or in the audience would have been asked to invest in Snapchat five years ago, we would probably all dismiss it. And you know, thank God they found somebody else who do. And, uh, and you know, it's now alive and kicking and it's real. The question is, you know, is Snapchat bound to be, I would say, more like a Twitter, more like a you know, niche, big niche, but you know, somewhat restrictive with a certain glass ceiling, or is it the real deal? Is it the new Facebook? Is it going to take over? Is it, from a brand perspective, going to be one of those three uh, big players in digital advertising? Awesome. What do you guys see? Unless we are not still ready, obviously, uh, we want to create a 360 degrees platform on which one uh, having co touch point with, uh, especially with the uh, young target uh, that we are uh, switching on uh, some of our investment. Uh, so we are looking at Snapchat. Uh, we are not sure that it will be the next Facebook or Instagram or, or vice versa. Instagram will kill uh, Snapchat uh, for the reason that we discussed uh, just a few minutes ago. But anyway, something that we, we must could, uh, look at. Definitely. Any of you deployed, you know, your clients are asking you to spend money on Snapchat yet? I think it's extremely, extremely valuable but it's not for everyone. I think it's extremely yeah. valuable for, for some brands. Uh, but, you know, like Nathan said earlier, like for him, for example, he just cannot find the audience that he's after there. So, you know, it's, it's another tool right. and it can be extremely valuable for someone, but absolutely useless for someone else. So, right. yeah. All right. But I think, I think it does have a place to exist, absolutely. Sure. I think it's kind of interesting, Snapchat, when you think about it from a as a brand, on, you know, you always think on social networks, we need to create content. When you actually talk to Snapchat, they're like, you're a brand, you don't need to create content, you need to, within Snapchat, it's all about advertising. And actually the advertising, I think, within Snapchat is done really well, it feels really integrated. It's not like they're trying to lift something they saw on TV or stick some banners in. Like, it's actually, it, it is very native. Um, and I think that's super interesting about them. And we, you know, we have tested Snapchat advertising before. We're a luxury brand. You know, the average age <clears throat> on Farfetch is 36. But we, we, de we tested Snapchat advertising, and it, and it works really well. So that's kind of interesting, I think, because you don't, you know, you think it's really young. You think it's like 14-year-old right. kids. But actually, they're comfortable with advertising in that environment. So I, I think it's definitely one to watch. Interesting. So, you know, Rachel was more positive, but I guess the general sentiment <laughs> was that uh, Despite everybody being intrigued, it doesn't play yet or unclear, you know, when is it going to play a role as sort of a mainstream uh, platform for uh, brand storytelling that could be as, uh, you know, as one of the big two. Oh. Um, so, you know, I already bashed Twitter a little bit, but uh, from your standpoint, you know, is Twitter too cluttered of an environment to actually tell a brand story, a brand's message, or is this solid base of, uh, I guess, 200, 300 million uh, active influencers solid enough in order to uh, break through with a brand message? What, what have you guys seen? I, I mean, for us in our experience, and, and here I'll speak to packages and programs we've done for advertisers, it's not the, it, 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 it's, it, in no way is it sort of the end to it in itself. It's, it's 
part of the program and part of the amplification, but right. Twitter unto itself isn't powerful enough to sustain an advertiser program or, or a message. Interesting. So you're saying it's more of a mean of distribution, it's not necessarily a brand building tool by its own. Correct. Yeah, basically we use the as a media relation tool. And so, yeah, as you say, the, 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 the base of uh, influencers is so huge, so it's very important to, in terms of media relation uh, um, touch this kind of, uh, of influencer. And Twitter, from my point of view, is the, the best social media that you can use. Yeah, for business to business and sort of media yes. communications, uh, ab 100%. Absolutely, to yeah, reach journalists and media and press and so on. Yeah. We're saying specifically in the context of brand, we're saying, you know, it may be a, um, yes, not, so at least not as a standalone, maybe yeah. as part of an ecosystem. So, you know, I guess for the sake of a standalone item, we'll uh, swipe it left and move to the new radio, or is it? You know, how many people in the audience have subscribed to podcasts? Any of you? That kind of answers it, but we, you know, before we do swipe right, just from the uh, interest of brand, uh, have you guys looked at actually shifting budget? Jamie, do you guys see your clients, Nathan, you know, people are actually going wholeheartedly after podcast, or is it still um, a novelty? I haven't seen, at least I haven't seen none of my clients come to me uh, to go after uh, podcasts. I do subscribe to podcasts. I think they're there is a fantastic opportunity for uh, creating brand and content there. You even see people like Tim Ferriss, who grew his personal brand immensely uh, on, uh, after he, uh, he started his podcast. But I think if he becomes something that's just kind of like a radio commercial before podcast, I think you're not necessarily... So you, you haven't thing. seen you know, activity in terms of brand building on this uh, media yet. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, pretty much? Pretty much. All right, so I would say it's much like... Uh, what we said about Snapchat and others, the adoption is there, the consumers are there, brand building, uh, not quite yet, you know, maybe, uh, maybe going forward uh, more so. Um, videos uh, are everywhere, you know, it's been, uh, it's, it's kind of old news, but uh, there's definitely a renaissance of online video, uh, powered by the fact that, uh, uh, as we said, the two major players in the online industry, Google and Facebook, are very bullish about the future of video. Um, Obviously, we all like video, right? We all watch television, we all go to the movies, and you know, we all watch video online. But what is, you know, beyond video being great, um, what about the mass-produced video? You know, we're talking about technologies that kind of generate videos automatically, that give you all those uh, muted, uh, caption-assisted uh, videos that appear, that appear on your social feeds. You know, do we feel that this kind of uh, non-professionally produced uh, smaller investment, more automated tool can really tell a story of a brand? I think, I, I mean, I, I have this debate all the time with our director of acquisition at Farfetch because he obviously wants tons of variations on videos. He wants to A-B test everything. And then I sit on the other side and I'm like, from a brand perspective, it's so, I get it, I understand why it's important, but actually telling a luxury message through something auto-generated, there's no, you, you know, that, Luxury is so nuanced, mm -hmm. so actually trying to throw that out in an automated way, I, I, I just don't think it's there yet. I, we kind of, I see the value, but I, it's, I haven't seen anything that, that kind of fulfills a luxury brand message <clears throat> with an auto-generated video. I, I get the race. I understand the race behind it. The reason, you know, it's like, yes, video gets more views, video gets more interaction, so what if we can create video at scale? Let's do it, you know? But at the same time, is that going to give you, uh, you know, will an automated video create you, I don't know, never say no to Panda? Will an automated well, video create you? It will obviously not it's replicate not. the, uh, you know, the production value of, uh, you know, Budweiser it's, it's Super Bowl commercial. Even but production maybe, Jamie, value let me direct you. Maybe it's inside. like, does it have value for less luxurious brands, maybe for SMBs? Uh, you know, will the scale be a solution, um, not only in terms of cost cutting, but also in terms of, Telling stories that are a little bit more simple and may not require this, you know, fancy packaging of a luxury brand. I don't think you necessarily need video to tell your brand story. Take, for example, uh, last week I was chairing uh, the, the jury at Eurobest, and one of the things that won huge and, and started as a print ad. You know, if Norwegian Airlines took a print ad that said bread is single, and they put the price of a ticket to LA the day after the, new, the whole news of Angelina and, uh, and, and bread came out. Right. 
And that print ad was shared on social media and everywhere like crazy. And it's a print ad. And it told you something about Norwegian Airlines and their brand and kind of how witty they are and so on and so forth. But uh, do you need a video necessarily to tell your brand story? I don't think so. I think you do need video, but if you're going to do it, then you do it for a reason. Yeah. I, I think with autom one thing I'll just add here, this is a great example of how a tool can be fabulous for some objectives and, and, and not right for others. So as a publisher, I'm trying to get my audience to grow here, 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 here. I'm trying to create more and more content to engage them. Um, but I'm also trying to keep operating costs low and producing video is really expensive. And so finding the right way to use automatic generated video tools is fantastic for me mm -hmm. as running a publishing business. As an advertiser, I think automated, at the end of the day, authenticity is so critical with any brand message, whether it's a print ad, a video, a, a tweet, <laughs> an Instagram post. Um, and that authenticity to the brand and what the brand is, I think, is harder to achieve right. with the automated video technology. So, so I guess the general consensus is that while it's, uh, um, you know, could be a great tool from a consumer or publisher standpoint, it's you know, not quite there in terms of, um, 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 ad, um, you know, online ads and, uh, and brand storytelling. We're getting closer to the end. You know, I really want to, whoops, it's like maybe somebody's hinting something, me jump right to the end. So we will just include the last one that uh, was, uh, I guess, automatically swiped for us, talking about the new front. So the history of upfronts was that in the world of media, there was scarcity. If a major network had, a, you know, a big show to run or a, a big new series to launch, there was limited amount of ad inventory that could go there. And so at the beginning of the year, they would throw those big events in which they would present them to the world of media and let the advertisers bid for placement. In the digital space, there is no issue of inventory, right? There's unlimited inventory. Uh, and yet, uh, the industry tried to replicate this uh, uh, beginning of year predictability for uh, the entire year's revenue by creating the new fronts. Are you guys bullish about Buying it in the new fronts, is that something that you guys do as brands or you guys advise your clients? Or, you know, is it just a great opportunity for tech geeks to march on a red carpet and, and nothing but? I mean, I, I can jump in here just as, again, based in New York and the last company that I was part of the exec team, I, I took us on a journey into the new fronts. I think you nailed it. I think that it's so, it's so different. The upfronts is genuinely a marketplace for the television industry. The new fronts, is not a marketplace. It's an opportunity to really just connect with, you know, between publishers, clients, and, and advertisers. But they and, do and look great when they share on Facebook those, you know, photos of themselves on a red carpet. Exactly. You know, cutting it's, your ribbon. It's, it's or fun and sexy and cool, but, you know, deals don't get done there the same way that the upfront forces um, deal making. Right. So let's imagine that we swap left on, on this one as well. <laughs> And before I'll say, uh, you know, thank our panelists for, uh, for their intriguing point of view, I'll say, you know, no pressure, guys. We recorded all of your answers. We're going to meet right here on this stage in a year from today. And, you know, we're going to remind you your predictions. And if we'll see <laughs> okay. that, you know, virtual reality became the center of gravity for all ad dollars, while Instagram stories are no longer, you know, we'll know how, uh, how seriously to take your uh, observations and predictions for next year. <laughs> Meanwhile, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story and for the audience to listen. I hope you enjoy the rest of Unbound. Thank you. Thank you.